Hey pilots, it's Plasma 1945 coming to you with another video and today we're going to have an in-depth look at AIM-9, the Sidewinder, a snake which can see heat of your aircraft. And this video was so long I broke it up into one or two or maybe three parts so make sure you hit subscribe, like and follow the channel not to miss the next one. And if you're a pilot like me flying in DCS World and have a squad or just some friends and you want to play around in custom missions and scenarios, Fox3MS will set up a dedicated server for you. Easy, fast, and affordable. And best part is you don't need to be a nerd to do it. The name Sidewinder. Well, the missile got its name from a snake which can, like the missile, see heat from its prey. That's right, the herpetologist in me, and that is a person who studies snakes and reptiles will tell you that the Sidewinder is actually a pit viper, a rattlesnake, a horned rattlesnake for that matter, a snake that can see heat of its prey in the desert. And that's where the Sidewinder gets its name from. So now that you know that, you might be wondering, why is a snake called a Sidewinder? Well, this comes from the movement. The Sidewinder snake winds across the sand, leaving a very specific mark on the ground. Here you can actually see it moving across the sand sideways. This way it limits the amount of its body that touches the hot sand. And the last thing you want to do in the desert is cook yourself. Right, so we didn't come here for a biology lesson, but we did come here to talk about the Sidewinder missile. We know that as long as there have been aircraft and as long as there have been wars, people have been shooting at each other. Originally, World War I, you could have had a pistol or a flare gun or a pair of machine guns or cannons, but then as World War II came around and then after World War II we got into the jet age where airplanes got faster, you could no longer whip out your pistol and shoot the other pilot and in many cases the aircraft got more maneuverable. You need to be able to hit a pilot on the other side or at least take out the airplane in some other way. And Sidewinder was born in China Lake. That's right, at China Lake Naval Ordnance Station is where the Sidewinder came to be. Originally, China Lake Station was designed to be a naval testing place, almost a Silicon Valley for US weapons during World War II, established in 1943 to test out things like remote fuses on air-to-air -air cannons, artillery. But later, China Lake actually became the hub of technology and weapons development in the United States. The fact that it's only 130 miles north of LA in the desert with plenty of room to fly your plane, lots of sunny days, and not a hell of a lot of things around it except for snakes and dust, well, great place to test out your weapons without hurting anybody else. And in China Lake, William B. McLean and his team came up with the Sidewinder missile. The key was tracking a heat source. First it was called the SW-1, the GAR-8, the Guided Air Rocket by the Air Force, or the AAM-N-7, Air-to-Air Navy Missile Type 7. By 1950, the missile was ready and started to be deployed with Air Force and Navy aircraft in 1957. The production version of the Sidewinder was the AIM-9 Bravo, and it had all the basics that are still on the Sidewinder to this day. A lot of its features haven't changed much, but here are the basics. Solid rocket motor, a fragmentation warhead, and a passive infrared proximity fuse, and we're going to talk about the fuse a little bit later on in the video. Once the rocket was launched, its motor would give it about two seconds of burn time, which would get it up to a speed of about Mach 1.5. Beyond that, it had gas actuators, which would control the fins to give the missile some steering while it tried to track down its target. I got a good lock. Fire it. Just as unique as the infrared seeker, the missile had rollerons to make sure the missile doesn't tumble when it flew. These are the little wheels you'll see on each of the four fins on the back of the missile that is still there to this day. And these acted like gyroscopes. When the missile would launch, the air would cause the rollers to spin and the rollerons would act like gyroscopes, preventing the missile from tumbling into every direction. And those little rollerons are still on every single Sidewinder almost 70 years later. This was the first version, it wasn't perfect. It couldn't have too much of a G-load, so it couldn't turn very hard, turn very fast. It couldn't chase down after super maneuverable targets, and its seeker could only see about 4 degrees, which is not very much. Very rarely could you score a hit on a maneuverable target like a MiG-17, but for a MiG-15 or a bomber, it was perfect. But overall, only 16% of the missiles actually had a hit, which wasn't very much. 
Now, before I tell you about the other versions of the missile, we're going to take a detour to West Germany. Indeed, the Sidewinder missile got a whole bunch of letters behind its name, one of which was the AIM-9BFGW, otherwise known as the AIM-9F, F standing for foreign. West Germany was a trusted partner and produced its own version of the AIM-9 Sidewinder, similar to the AIM-9E, which we're going to talk about later, but it used solid-state electronics and was called the AIM-9F. That's right, one side of Berlin had Sidewinders, the other one had SA-2s that shut down Gary Powers. The world was in a bad place. But let's come back to the missile. There is a lot of different Sidewinders, and that is all the cause of Air Force and Navy, because the family of the Sidewinders had had a split. The Navy had their own specifications, the Air Force had their own. The Air Force ended up creating the E and J models, whereas the Navy created the D, G, and H models. And that's the ones we're going to talk about in this video, and we'll talk about the L and M models in the following video. Let's talk about the Air Force variants first. The AIM-9E in the Air Force model had a different types of fins, the canards on the front. It had a more sleeker nose, and they put in a thermoelectric cooler, which uses an electric current to continuously cool the seeker, making it more susceptible to picking up targets. Remember, unlike the Navy, an Air Force crew could be standing by for many hours refueling before they could fire the missile. From the AIM-9E came the AIM-9J, which improved the gas generator so the missile could maneuver longer and improved the control system. But basically, AIM-9B became the E, became the J, and eventually became the N in the Air Force arsenal. <laughs> Just like the Air Force, the Navy wanted a missile of their own. They came up with the AIM-9D. That missile had a liquid nitrogen cooling system to make sure its seeker was cooled and was more sensitive to picking up enemy targets. It had a sleeker nose, but the biggest thing was that cooler, which was integrated into the launch pylon on the airplane and would cool the missile for up to two and a half hours. It had a better seeker, better glass, and became more streamlined, and you can see the comparison there. Beyond that, the Seeker's field of view was slightly reduced, but overall the missile became stickier to enemy targets, which meant it wouldn't lose lock quite as easily as an AIM-9B, which was kind of trash. Also, it got a slightly better motor, which meant it could go faster and get... The other major improvement was to replace the warhead. Before, it was... Think of a grenade, it just sent shrapnel in every direction. Now it became a continuous rod, which once the explosive went off, the rods would expand in every direction and literally cut an enemy plane in half. The D was so good that eventually it was actually put down onto Navy ships and into a mobile unit, the Chaparral, which would have up to four of these missiles and a Vulcan cannon to protect ground troops and Navy ships at sea. Earlier in the video, I told you that we will be talking about the fuse. Now, the fuse is how the missile knows when to explode, because most missiles will explode in a proximity of an aircraft they're targeting, not physically hitting it, because it's a lot harder to actually hit a target at such speed, so you need to get close to it and then blow up. Well, there's an infrared sensor on the AIM-9B through H models, which would pick up the heat from an enemy aircraft and once a certain threshold of heat was reached, the missile would know it's close enough to an enemy and detonate. But for this reason, you had to fire the Sidewinder at the back of the enemy aircraft. One, so the missile could see the heat source and follow it, but also so it would know when to explode because it needed that source of heat to know it had to detonate. Now, if somebody turned off their engine, or if somebody turned their plane or fired flares, that missile might not work or it could be decoyed. Now, a lot of people make fun of behind enemy lines where they drop their fuel tanks and create a fireball and the missile goes for that. Well, if the Russian missile that was fired was actually an AIM-9 Sidewinder from that age, this could have worked because it would have gone for the heat and its sensor would have set off the missile. The 
So in the Navy, the letter that follows D is G because that was the next version of the AIM-9 Sidewinder, the AIM-9G. It had an improved scanning mode for detecting targets, which could be linked to the aircraft's radar or other visual systems. And the F-4s and the F-18s used that function, allowing the missile to become a little bit more efficient at locking maneuverable targets. Well, AIM-9H followed soon after because the Navy realized that when they land aircraft on carriers and take off, the vacuum tubes, that's right, vacuum tubes made in 1900, were really susceptible to being bounced around at high G. So the AIM-9H became the digital sidewinder, having transistors instead of vacuum tubes. Other than that, the AIM-9G optical tracking system was left in place, and the AIM-9H and the G became the most advanced missiles. The AIM-9H was effective, it was more maneuverable, had more power and was really the best of the early Sidewinders. It had the highest kill rate in Vietnam and had the best maneuverability and lock-on capability. Now, that doesn't mean that it was amazing compared to the AIM-9M and AIM-9L that came after, but it was one of the most maneuverable missiles at the time. And the later AIM-9L and M came right from the AIM-9H. By the time the Vietnam War had ended, the Sidewinder was in its early 20s. A lot of its teenage problems were gone, but still, it could only attack targets from the back, looking for its heat source. The Sidewinder would get easily confused by shiny things on the ground or in the sky, and would get distracted and lose targets. Also, its range and maneuverability could be further improved. So, there was more work to be done, and that's where the AIM-9L and the AIM-9M came in. The Sidewinders that brought the family back together. And we're going to talk about that in the next video because I just ran out of time and space. So make sure you subscribe, follow the channel, and drop a comment below. Plasma1945, out.